So a very good evening, everybody. A warm welcome to our panelists and all the audiences today to this day three of certificate course in hypertension management, a case-based approach. So I am Dr. Nishita, and I am the medical lead for the hypertension portfolio. So uh, today we have some very interesting and relevant topics and which is going to be discussed by very eminent uh, uh, doctors with us today, all three of which do not require any introduction. And all three of been have been uh, are stalwarts in their respective fields. And I'm sure a panel like this, an esteemed panel like this, consisting of Dr. Uh, Hiremat sir, Dr. Kaul sir, and Dr. Konde sir, would indeed be an intellectual feast for all of us today. So before wasting much time, uh, let me give a short presentation about Sodia. What exactly is Sobio or Sodia all about? Next slide. Next slide. So uh, we are a multinational company uh, headquartered in Paris. One thing which distinguishes us from the other pharma companies is that we are a non-profit foundation, which specifically means that we are not listed on the stock market. We do not have shareholders. So this has its own advantage and disadvantage. Uh, the advantage being that uh, we are independent. We are not under sh shareholders pressure and therefore we can take our own decisions. And the disadvantage is that we do not have an access to investors money and thereby we need to generate our own profits. So also about 100 million patients are treated daily with severe medicines worldwide. We are a leader in cardiology, second in Europe, fifth worldwide. And uh, we have about 25% of our total revenue invested in R&D, uh, which is much higher than the other top pharma companies, which invest maximum about 5% of their total revenue. So um, next slide. So with this, I would like to say that Sodia supports brand in India. Uh, so we have this make in India concept way before this came into being some months back. Also, we do not use any Chinese API. The API that is used in all Sovia medicine is manufacture is produced in one factory, uh, in a single factory across uh, in, in France, and it is sourced throughout the world. So your, your medicines, Sovia medicines, which your patients receive in India, is similar to the Sovia medicines the patient has been receiving in maybe Latin America, Eastern uh, Europe, or maybe uh, uh, all the other countries. So um, with this, I would like to, next slide, I would like to say that uh, we from Serdia would like to thank all the healthcare professionals who have been leading this fight in one way or the other. Thank you for your service during such crisis. Uh, next slide. So today's uh, agenda uh, starts with uh, Dr. Subhash Kaul's presentation, which is on management of hypertension in patients of acute stroke, which would be for a 15 minutes presentation, followed by a panel discussion uh, and followed by a five minutes Q&A. Uh, the similar thing would be followed for Dr. C.K. Ponde's presentation, uh, the topic of which is hypertensive urgency and emergency, uh, following the similar pattern. Um, next slide. So uh, I would like to actually go ahead and introduce the very esteemed Dr. M.S. Hiramat sir. So sir currently is a director in Cat Lab Ruby Hall in Pune. Sir has been a president-elect past CSI from 2016 to 18. Sir has been a chair in the scientific program of annual CSI 2016. Sir uh, is, has been a convener, National Interventional Council of India from CSI 2004 to 6. Uh, sir has conducted many live angioplasty courses in many national and international conferences. Sir has proctored many interventional cardiologist students and also has conducted many live courses across the globe. Sir has great experience in peripheral angioplasty and has been a part of uh, many groundbreaking trials and has multiple publications to his credit. Uh, sir, it is a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for being part of this. And uh, sir, we hand over the session to you. Uh, kindly introduce our uh, speakers for the day. Over to Hello. you, sir. Good evening, Nishita. Yes. And uh, good evening, everybody. 
Uh, I'm sure all of you are waiting for a feast uh, uh, on hypertension, the emergency, urgency, as well as stroke. So we have Dr. Subhash Kaul giving the first talk on hypertension management in acute stroke. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Kaul is DM in neurology from PGI Chandigarh uh, that he did in 1990. Dr. Call, you look much younger than me. Hmm? <laughs> I don't think so. So, so uh, he's been in faculty for 27 years at Nizam Institute in Hyderabad. Uh, we know Nizam as a big teaching institute and has uh, produced so many uh, big names uh, from there. He retired as a professor and head of uh, department of neurology uh, and a dean in 2018 and he has done a stroke fellowship in 1994. Uh, he has a lot of research publication and uh, he has won the state uh, uh, teacher award by Telangana government. Uh, he was past president of Andhra Pradesh Neuroscience Scientific Association, past president of Indian Stroke Association and past president of Indian Academy of Neurology. So, Dr. Kaul, uh, just before you start, I think I might as well introduce Dr. Ponde. You have a next slide. Uh, change the slide. Yes. So, Dr. Ponde is a favorite of all the uh, postgraduates in Mumbai, and um, there are so many people who log into his talks. Uh, I'm sure uh, uh, he's a true ac academician as, as well as uh, he has a very vast experience, uh, vast leadership quality in academic area. Uh, he had a fellowship in intervention cardiology and electrophysiology from Brisbane, Australia uh, for four years from 93 to 97. Uh, he's a recipient of several awards uh, like Paul Harris Fellowship in 1995, Olympian Health Award in 97, Rashriya Manaseva Puraskar in 99, and National Prime Time uh, Award in 2016. He has uh, over 100 uh, publications in various national and international uh, journals and has delivered more than 500 lectures. Uh, in fact, I'm very fond of his uh, talks. I always request him for his slides at the end of every talk. And he, he always obliges me. Uh, he has received the Inspiring Cardiologist of India Award uh, uh, just uh, this week, beginning of this week uh, from Economic Times. And congratulations, uh, Dr. Ponde, on this uh, happening. Thank you. And currently he's the Vice President of Indian Academy of Echocardiography. In fact, uh, uh, there is a lot to learn from Dr. Ponde uh, in echo field. Uh, so over to you, Dr. Call, on your hypertension management in acute stroke. Should I share the screen? Dr. Nishita, can we get Nishita. Dr. Call's yes. slides? Uh, so, so you uh, need to start sharing your screen, sir. Yeah. Can you see, uh, Nishita? Yes. 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 Okay. We can um, hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for your kind introduction, dear friends and colleagues. Um, uh, good evening. I'm going to talk on the management of hypertension in acute stroke. And uh, all of you know that stroke is a uh, emergency which comes suddenly, unannounced. So, uh, and hypertension management plays a key role in the outcome of uh, the management. So we start with a case scenario of Mr. J, who is a 58 year old hypertensive. He comes to emergency department with acute hemiplegia. His blood pressure is found to be very high. He has a family history of stroke and also family history of hypertension. So this 58 year old man with hypertension and hypertension is to the tune of 225 by 110 diastolic and other things are by and large okay. This is the main problem which he is having in uh, in his stroke, high blood pressure of 225 by 110. So at this time, since you have to manage this, you have four options, what would you do? Will you do first his imaging to determine 
if it's a brain hemorrhage or a ischemic stroke, option one. Would you look also whether he has got a myocardial infarction, acute renal failure, or aortic dissection? Because that also may determine how much blood pressure you reduce. Uh, and would you uh, depend on these? The third option is, or you want both of them because you are, uh, this information is necessary to uh, reduce his blood pressure, how much to reduce? Or would you reduce his blood pressure irrespective of the above data? That means whatever may be, whether it's ischemic, hemorrhagic, whether he has MI, whether still you will uh, reduce his blood pressure. So which of them is incorrect? One of them is incorrect. So you please choose which one of them. The, yeah, uh, we request all the audiences to please start the voting. Uh, we'll take about 20 seconds and shoot up the answer. The most appropriate incorrect answer you have to choose. And uh, after that, we can have a little discussion on that. Right. So about 15 more seconds. About 10 more seconds. Last five seconds. Okay, I will see the result. 45% have answered uh, fourth. Uh, and so that the is the maximum. 45% yeah. is the maximum. Yes. Yeah, that is yeah. the maximum. 30% is for answer the third option. Yeah. So, so yeah, so 45% are correct. That means the target for BP reduction is different in different scenarios. It is not same. So uh, it depends on whether the patient has an ischemic stroke or whether it's a hemorrhage. That is the single most factor. It also depends whether the patient has a MI or a dissection of aorta or renal failure, because in these you have to reduce the blood pressure irrespective of anything. So this information is very important. If it's a brain hemorrhage, then you have to rapidly reduce the blood pressure to 140 systole particularly if it is more than 220, all the studies, uh, you know, there has been a famous study called indirect study, which has clearly shown that you have to reduce the blood pressure. It's very important that you have to do a rapid lowering of blood pressure to systolic 150. The reason being that this hematoma expands in size. In next 24 hours, there is a reduction, there's an increase of at least um, 30%, 30 to 40% of the size of the hematoma, at least in 30% of the brain hemorrhage patients. And it has been seen that if you rapidly lower the blood pressure, you can minimize or you can in fact prevent that hematoma expansion. So if it's a hemorrhage, you have to reduce the systolic to blood pressure to 140. On the other hand, if it's a ischemic stroke, the level of reduction will depend on are you going to thrombolize the patient or not. That is the single most important thing. If you are going to thrombolize this patient, since it's a ischemic stroke, then you have to bring down the blood pressure to 185 by 110. Otherwise, you don't touch it unless it is more than 220 systolic. So the single most factor for the systolic is that whether it is uh, whether he's a candidate for thrombolysis or not. So the take home message is in hemorrhage, reduce it. In ischemic stroke, don't reduce it unless you are going to thrombolize and still reduce it only to 185, not more than that. Now, our patient, Mr. J, has an ischemic infarct, so we have to reduce his blood pressure. Now, how do we reduce his blood pressure? His blood pressure is 225 systolic, and we have to reduce it to 185 because we are planning to thrombolize it. Which agent should we use? Should we use intravenous labetalol? Should we use intravenous micardipine? Should we use intravenous enalaprate? Or should we use some legal nifedipine? Because many of you know that if you do sublingual nitrogen, it can also reduce the blood pressure. So which is the which is the wrong choice out of these four? Out of these four, one is not appropriate. One is incorrect. So you have to choose that one. Which drug is not recommended? Other three are recommended. Yes. So uh, 20 seconds to for the answer. So we'll wait for 20 seconds and then we'll show the results. So Requesting all of you all to kindly press on the answer on your screen. You have to press on the incorrect option. Because other three are correct. The other last five seconds.
so 53% have replied fourth answer and 26% yeah. have replied first uh, number Abs one absolutely correct sublingual nifedipine should not be used for reducing the blood pressure that's absolutely correct answer because this uh, sublingual nifedipine can cause a precipitous fall in blood pressure which is not recommended in the acute stroke management acute ischemic because this can cause worsening of the neuro deficit by causing a steel phenomena so a lot of times if stroke patients in the periphery when they come to us they have reduced their blood pressure by this preparation and they come with an increase in the neuro deficit so there is a method of reducing the blood pressure it has to be done cautiously and it can be done by any one of these three either iv lobetalol or iv nicodepine or enalapril and it has to be done in a very gradual way when you do lobetalol you give only 10 mg and then wait and then see then you can give another 10 mg then you can wait and see or else you can start in nicodepine infusion slow infusion and but we should not cause a precipitous fall so uh, most of you are correct in this and this is the support to care from american uh, academy of uh, stroke and american heart association here clearly it says that patients who are candidates for acute thrombolysis or reperfusion in uh, reperfusion uh, thrombolysis you have to give them lobetalol 10 to 20 mg bolus over 1 to 2 minutes you can repeat it one more time and if you are not able to still reduce it then you can also try nicodepine 5 mg per hour iv titrate by slowly and titrate it and there's a maximum 15 mg per hour and majority of the time we are able to reduce because we have got a time limitation also we have to do it within the window period but usually in most of the patients we succeed by using any one of the two drugs the advantage of these two drugs is that they have got a short half life lot of times this high blood pressure is reactionary in these patients which comes down anyway so therefore we need to have drugs which have got a short half life and which have got a minimal effect on the cerebral vasculature per se and these two drugs uh, satisfy that condition so therefore we should use lobetalol or nicodepine you can also use enalapril hydrazoline clomipidine but these two are easily available uh, but the message is that don't use sublingual nifedipine because that can cause a fall in blood pressure okay now at this stage we have lowered the blood pressure and we have brought his blood pressure to let us say 170 by uh, 80 and now we have to give him iv uh, tpa or you can even do mechanical thrombectomy you know these days if there is a vascular occlusion you can do mechanical thrombectomy so through this slide what i want to uh, emphasize is whether it is mechanical thrombectomy or whether it is intravenous tpa the target blood pressure to be brought down is same which is 185 by 110 it is same either one of them and after you have given the thrombolysis or you have done the mechanical thrombectomy then you have to maintain the blood pressure even 5 degrees lower 180 by 105 for next 24 hours the reason being that one of the most important predictors of post thrombolysis bleed in the brain is high blood pressure most important thing so we have to at least bring it to this level we don't want to cause a precipitous fall also but we have to maintain it this level now now that was about the thrombolyzed patient now we come to the non thrombolyzed patient these are the patients who did not qualify for thrombolysis so which of the statements is once again incorrect about these patients these are non thrombolyzed patients statement number 1 is that blood pressure should not be lowered if it's more than 220 by 120 don't lower it if it's more than 220 by 120 statement number 1 statement number 2 is that blood pressure if it is less than 220 by 120 uh, should be lowered on day 1 itself if there is myocardial infarction and renal failure or any other hypertensive emergency then it should be lowered on day 1 itself statement number 3 is that blood pressure less than 220 by 120 should not be lowered for first 2 to 3 days after stroke that means if it is less than 220 120 keep it like that only for 2 to 3 days and after that you can reduce and blood pressure should be lowered rapidly to the extent of 30% per day that means when you decide that you will lower the blood pressure lower it almost 30% per day now out of these four statements three are correct and one is not correct it is inappropriate so you have to choose which one is inappropriate other three are correct please take start yeah uh Yeah, so twenty seconds to vote.
10 seconds. Uh, so the results show 68% have answered the fourth option. Absolutely. 22% yeah. Yeah, yeah, has, has answered correct. the third question. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. 68%. I think this is a very well-informed audience and they are listening to the lecture. Uh, first three statements are correct. Uh, if it is more than 220 by 120, that is really high blood pressure. You have to lower it, even if it's the day one. Okay. These are the non-thrombolized patients. Now, if it is less than 220 by 120, you should not lower it. You can keep it because you see this much of blood pressure is required. It's called permissive hypertension. But if there is an associated MI or a renal failure or an aortic dissection, in that case, you have to lower. And I think Dr. Pondé is going to talk about hypertensive emergencies. You will hear about it. And when do you lower this 220 by 120? Some people lower it after 24 hours, some after 48 hours but definitely not before 24 hours. After that, you can, you can reduce it at two to three hours. And when you reduce it, reduce it gradually by, by not more than 15% per day. So if you do more than 30%, this may reduce the good outcome chances in these patients. So that is very correct. Okay. Now, uh, so this is the same thing, what we already said, same thing is being shown in this, uh, uh, in this graph. So I'll go forward. Now, patients, blood pressure has been uh, reduced during the acute phase. He has received his thrombolysis. This is day fourth of the stroke patient. Now you have to discharge him. Now you have to give him an antihypertensive therapy for prevention of the second stroke or the recurrence of what's called secondary stroke prevention. So which will be your first choice uh, as far as drugs are concerned out of these four? One is uh, renin angiotensin system inhibitors alone, right? ACE inhibitors alone or ACE inhibitors plus diuretics or CCB. Combination. Combination of ACE inhibitor plus diuretic or CCB. Third is beta blockers alone. Fourth is none of the above. So you can go, I, I'll repeat. One is RAS inhibitors alone. Second is RAS inhibitors plus diuretic or plus CCB. Right? Third is beta blockers. Fourth is none of the above. Yes, so 20 seconds to vote. Before secondary prevention, long term treatment. 10 seconds. Okay, so maximum of them have replied. 75% has replied to answer B. So two, uh, RAS inhibitor plus diuretics. Yeah, perfectly all right. I think the score of audience also is gradually increasing from 40% to 50% to 60 and now 70%. <laughs> so this is, this is perfectly all right. This combination therapy uh, is the ideal therapy because, you know, ACE inhibitors alone don't have a strong antihypertensive effect. So alone, they don't work very well. But when you use them with diuretics or with CCBs, their action really is accentuated. Beta blockers definitely are not the first choice for the long-term prevention in stroke patients. They have not even been tested. And uh, that, is, uh, that is correct thing. And here again, it is the same thing. It is showing in the tabular form. You can all get them from the website or from this presentation later on. This is the class of evidence level of recommendation in grade 1A, what you already said. Uh, and if you take any of these worldwide associations, whether it's say International Stroke Association or American Heart Association or European Association or JNC, all of them are saying the same thing, that the first choice for secondary prevention must include an ACE inhibitor and you can include either a thiazide diuretic with it or you can include a CCB or calcium channel blocker. The reason being the studies are shown like that. The first study which uh, came was PROGRESS study uh, uh, it tested uh, the combination of uh, ACE inhibitor plus perindopril, which is a diuretic. And uh, they found that there is a clear cut benefit uh, in reducing the chance of a second stroke. The advantage of this study was that it, the cohort consisted of patients who already had a stroke. So therefore, we are, this population is different from a general population because they have already suffered one stroke. 
So therefore, uh, progress study showed clearly that ACE inhibitor uh, and perindopril was helpful in prevention of second stroke. And this is again showing the same thing. You are all aware of these forest plots where you are showing that there is a definite advantage in reducing the blood pressure and in reducing the uh, you know, uh, second event if these patients were treated with this combination. And there was another study called ESCOT study. And ESCOT study, uh, uh, which came later, it showed the similar results in patients you know, who used ACE inhibitor along with calcium channel blocker combination. And here also they showed that there was an advantage uh, compared to other treatments. So therefore you have got this option. You can either use ACE inhibitor plus diuretics or ACE inhibitor plus CCB. That depends upon the individual profile and tolerability of the patient. You know, some patients may not uh, tolerate a particular drug. So in that case, we can change. So therefore, in our patient, Mr. J, his, uh, to summarize what, what was done in him, his high blood pressure was lowered from 225 by 120 to 180 by 110 with intravenous nicardipine, because of which he was able to be thrombolyzed with IVTPA. He was kept under strict BP monitoring for 24 hours. In between, his BP had shot up, but that was managed with IV lobotilol to maintain his blood pressure around 180 by 105 for 24 hours. He was observed for next two days. And after two days, he was given the combination of perindopril plus endepamide, uh, which is uh, the first choice. And he was also put on aspirin, atorvastatin, uh, 24 hours after the intravenous thrombolysis. He was advised lifestyle change, diet modification, and physical activity for prevention of second stroke. And he was counseled for uh, treatment adherence, home BP monitoring, and regular BP checkup. Uh, after one month at follow-up, his systolic blood pressure was well controlled, uh, 140, diastolic 84, although it could be reduced further, but there were no CV events and no ad adverse events were observed. And at three months, his systolic blood pressure came down to about 132, diastolic 81, lipid profile normal, his ECG, MRI, ultrasound were normal, and there were no events. And he continues to be under observation. Uh, observation means follow-up, regular follow-up, three-monthly follow-ups. So in summary, stroke causes hemodynamic consequences, uh, not only on the brain, but all over the body. And it makes management of the blood pressure in stroke complex, requiring diagnosis of stroke subtype, hemorrhage versus ischemia, and also precise definition of therapeutic goals. That means whether the patient also has associated MI or uh, other comorbidities. In patients with acute ischemic stroke, BP should be lowered immediately if we have to thrombolyze him. And after that, antihypertensive drugs should be initiated over the course of time. And then BP lowering in the uh, hypertension patients for secondary stroke prevention also is very important. And preferably, they should be started on ACE inhibitors and diuretic or CCB, calcium channel blocker combination, depending upon the patient's stroke. Thank you very much. I'm done. Yeah, yes. thank you, Dr. Call. Uh, we are attentive. We know you're done. <laughs> <laughs> this was the last slide. Uh, yeah, so this was a nice case, but the way you took us through the case, I think that was really uh, very, very good. Thank you. Uh, I had a question. This family history of uh, stroke, uh, does it change like this Mr. Jai's uh, father or mother had a stroke? So do we anticipate stroke for the next generation also? Yes, yes, yes. In fact, uh, this is one of the risk factors. And um, uh, all the stroke patients, if you take any cohort, one third of them have a family history of stroke. So therefore, it becomes all the more important for people who have got a family history to control their other risk factors very aggressively to neutralize this risk. It can be neutralized. So they have to control their other risk factors. So as a primary prevention, I mean, before he got the stroke, uh, should we be using uh, ARB, uh, diuretic, amlodipine combination? Uh, think, because anyway, uh, uh, you are using it after the stroke. Yes. So why not before? You know? Before also. Before also it has been shown that ACE inhibitors, particularly in combination with other agents, should be given because ACE inhibitors do uh, these vascular, uh, there's a vascular, you know, uh, endothelial benefit in these patients. So therefore... We can give them any antihypertensive along with ACE inhibitor, even for but, the primary prevention. But amongst the uh, drugs that you pick up, yeah. Uh, yeah. once you say that there is a family history and you'll be concerned about the patient in front of you, yeah. uh, you would choose ARB or you, have, you will choose uh, 
uh, calcium blocker. Like say, 45-year-old is in front of you for mild hypertension or moderate hypertension. Ideally, and, I, ideally speaking, you know, one thing is there that for uh, reduction of the blood pressure in a young person, I would choose azides because they, they bring down, but it depends on some people, we can choose CCB also. CCB, thiazides plus an ACE inhibitor. I would like to choose ACE inhibitor. I prefer ACE inhibitors to ARBs because particularly in the field of stroke, ACE inhibitors have more evidence than ARBs. But I, I would combine those ACE inhibitors with either a diuretic or a CCB. Dr. Ponde, you have any questions? Sir, you need to unmute yourself, sir. You're muted. And you should type there any questions in the so chat there are, box. Yeah, there are a lot of questions coming in. Uh, okay, so I will take the first question from Dr. Arindam. Uh, at what value of MAP in ischemic and hemorrhagic CBA should we consider lowering the BP, rate at which the blood pressure should be lowered? No, I, as I already said, it depends on if, if it's a hemorrhagic stroke. If it's a hemorrhagic stroke, our aim is to bring the systolic blood pressure to 140, right? Systolic blood pressure to 140 because we are afraid of the expansion of the hematoma. If it's a ischemic stroke, you have to think whether you are going to thrombolize the patient or not. If you are going to thrombolize the patients, then you have to bring the blood pressure down to 180. You have to bring up the patient, you have to bring the patient down to 180 systolic and 110 diastolic. That is the level which you have to reach if you are going to thrombolize the patient. If you are not going to thrombolize the patient, then don't touch the BP for next one to two days. I would say for next one day, don't touch it at all, unless it is more than 220 by 120. Okay. So, so the level will depend on are you thrombolizing or not. If you are thrombolizing, then your target is 180 by 110. If you are not thrombolizing, then your target is 220 by 120 for next 24 hours. After that, you can slowly reduce. Okay. So uh, the next question is uh, from Dr. Uh, Sanjib Banik. Uh, can intravenous NTG be used in reducing BP in stroke ischemic in the tune of 210 by 120? That's what is written. You see, I think he's asking whether intravenous nitroglycerin or sodium nitroprusside can be used. First, you should yeah. try lobitolol. First, you should try lobitolol or first you should try nicodapine because they don't cause such a drastic reduction. Oh, yes. But if they fail to reduce within half an hour, then you have to use sodium nitroprusside. Or if your diastolic is as high as 140 from the very beginning, if your diastolic is 140, if your systolic is more than 250, then you can use nitroprusside. Otherwise, don't use it in the very beginning because that also can cause sometimes a rapid fall. And the second thing is that any patient who needs sodium nitroprusside, you should not thrombolize those patients. The need of such an aggressive blood pressure therapy uh, itself means that this patient is at a risk of hemorrhage. But yes, you can use it in situations where your lobitolol and nicodapine fail or where your blood pressure diastolic is very high from the very beginning. This is as per the American Heart Society recommendation. Perfect. So uh, next question is Dr. Hasim Reza from Kolkata asking, Sir, after how many days should we start antiplatelet drugs? And is there any role of anticoagulant in ischemic stroke? We should start antiplatelet uh, if you are thrombolyzing him. You see, everything depends on thrombolysis or not. Because thrombolysis is now a standard treatment of ischemic stroke, as it is of myocardial infarction. So all my answers will have, is the patient being thrombolyzed or not? If you have thrombolyzed a patient of ischemic stroke, then you, have, you will start antiplatelet only after 24 hours, not before that. Uh, and anticoagulation only if a patient has a cardioembolic stroke. That means atrial fibrillation or a clot in the heart or post myocardial infarction. In these patients, you will give uh, oral anticoagulants after about a week or so. Perfect. Or if a patient has an underlying procoagulant state, which is very uncommon. Perfect. So due to paucity of time, we'll just take one yeah. last question. Uh, does IV mannitol uh, can be used in acute accelerated hypertension with CCA ischemic? With CCA, what is CCA? 
calcium channel calcium iv anyway iv mannitol is a, it is not a treatment for stroke it is not a treatment sometimes if a stroke patient has got a very raised intracranial pressure then you can use it for a limited time maybe for the first one day or so there you can use it but it it is not it is neither a anti hypertensive uh, uh, nor it is a anti stroke treatment it can reduce cerebral edema uh, so there you have to use it for a short period for about one day you can use it and in the meantime you have to find out what is the cause of that ccp very many times it is the cause is because of a big stroke which needs actually a decompression neurosurgical decompression but till the time neurosurgeon comes and does his surgery and does decompression you can use iv mannitol as a you know temporizing measure yeah perfect so we have a lot of questions coming in but we would not be able to answer due to positive you can time. email it to uh, you and you can email it to me perfect yes, yes. we will do that Uh, so now we will move on, sir. Over to you, Hiramat, sir. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Pondey, you can begin your talk. Uh, thank you, Dr. Call. It was really interesting the way you put uh, took us through the entire course. Thank you, sir. But I hope you are staying because Dr. Pondey yeah. also have some. Uh, I'm neural... waiting for his talk. Yes. <laughs> so, can you see my slides now? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, thank But you. But you put it on a slide show. Doctor yeah. Pondey yeah. put it on a slide show. Yeah. Uh, Doctor Call, thank you very much for that uh, uh, interesting case and taking us through the case. Uh, now I'll start with hypertensive emergencies and urgencies. I don't think I was telling Nishita this can be covered in 15 minutes all urgencies, but I think I'll just But give no. a brief overview. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, hypertensive crisis is a more generalized term. It's not defined by specific blood pressure reading. Rather. it's a clinical syndrome that is associated with acute elevation of blood pressure and broadly it is categorized into two types emergencies and urgencies epidemiologically approximately 1% of hypertension patients may develop crisis during their lifetime and much higher rates have been reported in blacks african americans and patients with low socio economic status simply because of their poor compliance to anti hypertensive therapy and the incidence is twice as much in men as compared to women now this is my first case which shows you a 65 year old male hypertensive chronic smoker driver of occupation my own patient he complained of headache for the 3 days with increasing severity over the past one day and presented with vomiting and altered sensorium there was no focal neurological motor deficit he has been non compliant to drugs for the last 15 days as per his doctor he was hemodynamically his pulse was 70 blood pressure was 240 over 140 cardiovascular system examination showed no third heart sound but lungs showed bivasal krebs saturations were 90% on room air so what was the diagnosis and what would you do my question to the audience is which type of case is this patient is it a hypertensive urgency is it a hypertensive emergency or it is accelerated hypertension or is it malignant hypertension and i i can tell you all these terms are being used interchangeably sometimes with in a confusing manner that's why this first question so requesting all of you all to vote uh, 20 seconds till i show the answers yeah then no seconds the accelerated hypertension and malignant hypertension are terms which are quite loosely used and i will tell you the definitions of the that end of this poll okay so maximum around 50% has voted for b hypertensive emergency 37 has voted for hypertensive urgency and 12% has voted for malignant fair enough so we will see what is the correct answer so what is a hypertensive emergency is characterized by severe increase in systolic and diastolic blood pressure with signs or symptoms of acute end organ damage so pressure is not important pressure is usually between 180 to 220 diastolic is above 120 to 130 but they have evidence of target organ damage so when there is a target organ damage it is an emergency and requires immediate blood pressure reduction in a few hours it requires icu admission and intravenous drugs as against when it is urgency there is a severe elevation of blood pressure almost on the same tune but without symptoms of signs of target organ damage that is an urgency and here 
you may you may treat the patient initially with the oral drug you may may not require uh, icu admission whereas accelerated hypertension is a relatively stable patient without target organ damage with blood pressure less than 180 by 120 that is accelerated and anyone who has a papillary edema means it is malignant hypertension so malignant is a word used for papillary edema so this is a typical picture of papillary edema and i always ask my students where are all the fundoscopes gone you know they are never seen in medical wards and cardiology wards now they are only seen with ophthalmologists so urgencies are essential hypertension uncomplicated or uncomplicated secondary hypertension post operative hypertension is typically an urgency not an emergency uh, then rebound hypertension with a sudden withdrawal of cordyly is again an hypertensive urgency and anxiety or panic attacks with transient episodic severe hypertension is an urgency so here in urgency you do not rise do not lead to rapid reduction of blood pressure is not recommended in absence of target organ damage because here you can precipitate sometimes stroke and you can sometimes precipitate myocardial infarction also in an elderly uh, and therefore acute reduction is harmful so how do you know when there is a target organ damage so go by symptoms if there is a chest pain you can be you can have the patient with acute coronary syndrome or you can have thoracic aortic dissection a ripping back pain will usually mean thoracic aortic dissection severe dyspnea will mean acute pulmonary edema and delirium nausea vomiting which my patient had may mean hypertensive encephalopathy or an ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke as dr kaur was just uh, presenting his case so end organ damage 83% patients will have single end organ damage while around a minority 15% will have multiple end organ damage the commonest is the top story problem that is cerebral infarction 25% a quarter will have pulmonary edema 15% will have hypertensive end cap altered sensorium mild cerebral edema but no infarct as such or no bleed as such and around 12% will have acute coronary syndrome yet a minority will have intracerebral bleed 4% and dissection and encapsia are very very rare in 2% of patients so all organs can be affected brain heart retina and the kidney and the classic combination duo of pathophysiology is there is a vasoconstriction and there is a hypovolemia please remember majority of these patients are hypovolemic so giving diuretics to them many times than not is harmful they have increased catecholamine excess they have activation of ras they have altered auto regulation of brain circulation and in the terminal phase in patients who have high mortality they have activation of interleukin 6 in fact interleukin 6 elevation is considered as a bad prognostic marker in patients with hypertensive uh, crisis activation of platelets and coagulation cascade finally leads to end organ damage so what will you do next one i will admit the patient to icu and start the investigations including iv therapy that is the first option or no i would like to send in investigations from er start oral therapy and if the bp comes down in 4 to 8 hours i may not need admission that is your second option or third i am confused i will start oral therapy in emergency department and wait for the investigations and then i will decide what to do your time starts now yeah so 20 seconds uh sometimes this call is difficult to take but as i was saying end organ damage is your guide is your best guide so i'll so most of them have replied a first option very good so percent yeah so dr kaul's lecture has uh, really done uh, wonders because they know now that if you have a target organ damage the patient needs to be admitted and the symptoms we, the investigations these are the routine investigations fundoscopy 2 led ecg hemoglobin platelet count urine albumin to creatinine ratio urine microscopy for sediments very very important whereas specific tests will depend upon what is the isolated end organ damage if you have it brain you will get a ct or a 
diffusion MRI. If you have a heart, you will do 2D echo and everything further and the NT pro BNP and the HS troponin I and so on. So the focus investigations depend upon target organ damage. My patient had a hemoglobin of 14, a pack cell volume of 52. His creatinine was 1.9. His, his PCO2 was 40 and PO2 of 66. Remember, he had some basal RALS. His fundus showed grade 4 hypertension retinopathy. He had papilledema. He had RBC cast in the urine and protein urea as well. On the peripheral smear, he had schistocytes. His ECG showed LVH with strain. Ejection friction was mildly depressed with the E by E prime elevated, suggesting increased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. But the CT plane brain excluded a bleed. We couldn't do a diffusion MRI. It was not feasible. Patient was too restless. So now, with all these labs, he had definitely hemoconcentration. He had acute renal injury. He had malignant hypertension papilledema. He had mild LV dysfunction. So no question, class 1A recommendation. This patient needs admission to the intensive care and then starting treatment with intravenous drugs. Intravenous drug. So the, the level of blood pressure reduction will depend upon, as I, Dr. Cole was saying, if it is, this was not an ischemic stroke. This was not a bleed either. This was just hypertensive in care. Here, no more than 25% reduction in the first, first hour. And then up to around 180 to 100 or 160 to 100 in the first 24 hours. The properties of an ideal parenteral drug include rapid onset of action, predictable response, titrable blood pressure to desired levels, minimal dose adjustment needed, and no associated coronary steel and minimal adverse effects. And we have several of these available. Remember, analaprilate, phenaldepam, and clavidipine are not available in our country. We have ismolol, we have labetalol, we have nicardipine, nitroglycerin, and nitroposide. Uropidil is coming in a big way in the West, not yet available in the country. Please remember the uh, clavidipine, which is uh, uh, just like nicardipine, is coming also in a big way. This is a very highly fat soluble drug and is a fat emulsion, actually, those of you who use. So it is absolutely contraindicated in patients with hypertriglyceridemia or severe dyslipidemia. It is very uh, contra, uh, is, is contraindicated drug. Uh, that is to be remembered. And this drug is again uh, uh, mainly metabolized by liver. So it's contraindicated in patients with severe liver dysfunction. Uh, Phenaldepam is used in some Western world. It's, it's, it's a drug which is a, a, a dopamine 1 uh, agonist. And this is a drug again contraindicated in patients with glaucoma and sulfur allergies. So please remember that. But other drugs are available with us. So which of these you will use will be your first choice, will be your next question. Nitroprusite, nitroglycerin, nicardipine, or analaprilate, or any one of the above. Your time starts now. Yes, so 20 seconds. Ten seconds. I think this will be a very difficult question to answer unless uh, unless person people have treated patients like this and they okay, know the guidelines. Yeah. So fifty percent is saying uh, IV nicardipine, that is the the third option, very and thirty three percent is saying any one of the above. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Actually, the actually, actually very learned audience. I, I agree with Dr. Call. See, if you have a hypertensive NK fear, the drugs of choice, the first two drugs of choice are labetalol and nicardipine. And my choice will be clearly nicardipine because I'm more comfortable with this molecule. It is very easily tratable, very predictable response, very minimal or negligible side effects and no virtual rebound or no gross rebound after discontinuation of the IV infusion, the way it happens with nitroprusside almost 30% of the times. So my first choice uh, in this patient will definitely be as audiences voted nicardipine and the second choice will be uh, labetalol. If there's an acute coronary event, the first choice will be obviously a, a nitroglycerin therapy. In dissection, 
when you want to reduce left ventricular dp by dt rate of force of left ventricular contraction which determines the extent of dissection your first choice will be definitely a beta blocker like ismolol so it all depends upon what emergency you are dealing with and in eclampsia the first drug of choice again is labetalol so i think nicardipine here uh, wins hands down so we gave this patient nicardipine achieved the bp of around 25% reduction to 160 by 110 at around 6 hours we hydrated this patient at 60 ml per hour of normal saline we did not give diuretic despite there being little basal ras for 24 hours we just managed him with supplemental oxygen his day 2 creatinine came down to 1.5 blood urea came down from 46 to 32 sensorium became near normal blood pressure was 160 105 post stability for the next 36 hours oral medications were started i gave a single pill combi combination of amlodipine metoprolol 5 by 25 at morning am and telmisartan 40 mg at bed time day 4 he was off iv off o2 bp was 150 90 creatinine further floated down to 1.4 and the potassium was uh, a 3.9 so he was discharged on the 7th day so this one trial i'll tell you there are lot that there, there, there are very few randomized controlled trials in hypertensive emergencies because of paucity of large number of patients of course uh, head on there are comparisons between nicardipine labetalol nicardipine nitroprusside etc but but these trials were underpowered to study outcomes they were only powered to study the efficacy of the drug side effects of the drug tolerability of the drug etc so this trial which was a multi center trial comparing uh, uh, nicardipine uh, this was more likely than labetalol to achieve target blood pressure in a short period of time now the next question these are very uh, 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 complex questions in which of the following would systolic bp of 100 to 120 to be brought down in the next 6 to 8 hours will be really appropriate a aortic dissection b thromboembolic stroke three hemorrhagic stroke d subarachnoid hemorrhage and e hypertension to nk your time starts now yes 20 seconds to vote See only in one emergency, such an aggressive BP reduction is appropriate. Other next five seconds. I'm sure the audience will get it right because Dr. Kaus' lecture vividly pointed out what are the blood pressure reductions in the uh, remaining four categories of patients. You know, so it's it's a fairly uh, uh, good, uh, fair question. I put it so, at this uh, lecture. You know. Yeah. So, eighty-eight percent have written aortic dissection. Have oh, fantastic! I'm so happy. I'm so happy. I think uh, the the job is done. The correct answer is definitely A. Now, uh, which emergency medication? In which emergency the medication is least appropriate? I'm saying least appropriate. Aortic dissection, ismolol plus nicardipine. Aortic dissection, B labetalol. C in eclampsia, magnesium and hydrolysine. D in pheochromocytoma, ismolol, and E in acute left ventricular failure, nitroglycerin. Which of this is the least appropriate, or the least correct, or the incorrect, or a wrong choice? Your time starts now. Twenty seconds to vote. Ten more seconds. Yeah. Okay. Great. What so, sixty percent uh, have answered pheochromocytoma, and ten percent have very great. acute LV failure. Yeah. No, no, no. I think that is the wrong choice. The pheochromocytoma is the wrong beta you cannot give beta blocker alone to pheochromocytoma so although labetalol is controversial in pheochromocytoma pure beta blocker is grossly inappropriate for pheochromocytoma i will quit this question because this is already covered with dr kaul's talk now this is the next question in hypertension with pregnancy all the following are true except except 
that means one is a wrong choice the other four are the correct choice so at a bp of 130 by 85 a patient may still experience hypertension in pregnancy hypertension emergency in pregnancy b definitive therapy for eclampsia is magnesium c help syndrome is a variety of preeclampsia and should be treated really very aggressively and d hypertension is the most common risk factor for placental abruption or abruptio placenti which is not correct which is not true your time starts now 20 seconds uh. question answers are coming in just 5 more seconds So sixty-one percent has answered a B. Definitive therapy for eclampsia is magnesium. Is a is an is an incorrect answer. That is absolutely correct because the definitive therapy of eclampsia is delivery of the fetus and the placenta, and not magnesium. So involve your consultant very early, gynec consultant very early, and uh, uh, that is where I stock it. And this was actually my reaction after Nishita sent her slides to me. So Nishita. Can I have two, three more minutes to cover four drugs, sir? This is my twenty, exactly twenty minutes are over. Go ahead. Yeah. So I'll just cover the pros and cons because this is very helpful for the audience. So in nitroprusside, the pros are dose-related BP reduction, drug of choice for most hypertensive emergencies, and a rapid onset of action. So it's very, very potent drug, but it increases intracerebral pressure. Please remember that. cyanide can build up and it is unstable in the ultraviolet light so it, the infusion entire bottle and the infusion set has to be covered with a dark black paper that we that we all know so there are the pros and cons of nitroprusside nitroglycerin the pros are is decreases the left ventricular end diastolic pressure so it's a great drug in acute coronary syndrome and acute pulmonary edema it reduces preload as well as afterload but the cons are it limits the patients with cardiac ischemia and pulmonary edema so in other other group of patients it is a fairly mild drug to use that's a con hydrazine the pros are historically it's used for the maternal i mean the preeclampsia and and hypertension in pregnancy but it causes reflex tachycardia and may provoke angina so in other than that indication it has its own cause in chronic use it can cause lupus like syndrome when used orally for a long long time more than 6 months or so beta blockers labetalol the pros are it may not need icu i have given it in wards on at least more than 30 40 occasions it's a good drug for aortic dissection and for cardiac ischemia as well but the cons are it has deep orthostatic hypotension so when you terminate the infusion when the patient is mobilized for the first time there is a lot of patients who have orthostatic hypertension it is contraindicated in heart block congestive heart failure asthma and pheochromocytoma ismolol is ultra short acting that is the biggest pro of this drug very very short acting so you can never cause precipitous fall with this drug it's a selective beta 1 antagonist so there is no side effect on lungs or bronchospasm etc but there are several contraindications including few pharmacytoma nicardipin is the best best bet in majority of the emergencies titrable less tachycardia but the con is caution in poor liver function please remember in end stage liver disease this drug is absolutely contraindicated because it is metabolized by the cy chromosome pathways like for example uh, cy uh, 2d8 3c9 and a14 so all these are situated in liver so severe liver dysfunction it is contraindicated and i rest my talk there i think i be another appellate is not available in our country thank you for your patient attention yeah thank you dr ponde um, i think you took us uh, it was a difficult topic to cover in such a short time and on that background i think uh, are you able to hear me or yes yes yes, yes. sir we can hear you 
so this was a great coverage and uh, i'm sure there is going to be a lot of excitement and more questions uh, so you have any question but uh, let me ask you dr ponde yes, uh, pregnancy and aortic dissection i'm sure a pregnant young female comes with acute pain uh, we think of aortic dissection as a possibility because they i mean there is no reason why they should get myocardial infarction so what is going to be your drug of choice just as anybody else or you would like to because this is generally towards the third trimester yes no here again the drug of choice will still be ismolol for the simple reason that it is very very short acting it loses left ventricular dp by dt in less than 10 minutes of infusion unfortunately it alone is not usually able to control the blood pressure very effectively in in dissections so it is able to control the heart rate and lv dp by dt but usually you need a add on and the best add on to this drug the best add on to this drug in pregnancy also could be nicardefin very very safe in pregnancy no uh, no uh, uh, bad effect on the fetus it it crosses placental barrier by only around 20% or so so it is very very safe drug to this combination ismolol and nicardefin is very easy to use in pregnancy okay nishita you can go ahead with uh, questions from the audience yes sir uh, so dr hitesh is asking uh, patients with copd and whom labitalol is contraindicated and nicardefin is not available what should be the next choice of drug in copd probably i will then bank upon bank upon either nitroprusside or nitroglycerin if there is no uh, neurological uh, uh, a possibility of raise intracranial pressure happening possibly i will choose ntp nit nipride rather than nitroglycerin if there is a lv failure uh st segment dynamic st segment changes uh, uh troponin i positive then i will probably use nitroglycerin okay sir so dr banik is asking has statins uh, do statins have a role in cva in bp of 210 by 110 i think that question should go to dr call <laughs> to dr call yes sir. yeah yeah statins uh, statins have uh, nothing to do with high blood pressure you have to give it anyway irrespective of the blood pressure Uh, particularly in the ischemic stroke right dr ajay achavli from mumbai is asking can amlodipine be used in acute stroke of pp more than 220 sir again no amlodipine should not be used in acute stroke once you have got a 220 by 110 we usually see again once again it depends for first if it is more than you are telling more than 220 by 110 uh, on the day 1 you have to i as i already told you you have to give either iv lobetalol or you have to give nicardepine and not amlodipine because amlodipine will take time for it to reduce so no okay uh, dr dang from delhi is asking in a gp clinic before sending patient to the hospital any oral medication that can be advised sorry in, in which setting it's a, it's a acute stroke it's acute it's, it's it's just mentioned okay. Okay, I may I just keep it then. Dr. Call, you can take it as uh, hypertensive end cap or uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe a stroke, and then Dr. Ponde can take it for uh, ACS or LVF. Can you read that question again? Uh, okay, in the GP clinic before sending yeah. patient to the hospital, any oral medication that can be advised? I think if you don't uh, see, for instance, let us say if this patient is having a very high blood pressure. Uh, that that I will leave to Doctor Ponde. But yeah. if he has a hemiplegia or anything, then I would not recommend any medicine because, as I said, we have to do the imaging first. But but okay. uh, but if he doesn't have, then I think Doctor Ponde can answer whether he can recommend any supplement. Question is really vague, you know. I think we should go to the next. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay okay. So Doctor Dinesh Puri is asking choice of calcium channel blocker. It does not mention anything beyond that. choice of calcium channel blockers all right yes. uh, i'll tell you for the chronic management of hypertension we have several calcium channel blockers now but the newer ones which are coming in the market now uh, which are l and n type of uh, uh, l and n channel blockers they have uh, three biggest advantages the edema the frequency of edema is very less though they are milder drugs they require larger dosages and the second important point is they they uh, protect the kidney from 
uh, the afferent arterial hypertension. So they reduce proteinuria and increase renal survival and albuminuria. So these are the better drugs now, uh, which are uh, which can be given for management of hypertension. Yes. Okay, so there is uh, Dr. Ranjani asking: Should we continue or discontinue ACRB use when patients reach stage four or five? I do not know. Stage four or five CKD. They may be. You may be asking. Okay, CKD yeah. maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I think you see if the EGFR is less than if the EGFR is less than fifteen. Uh, most of these drugs will be contraindicated. 15, 1, 5. Between 30 and 15, you have to be really, really very cautious. So the patient is very compliant, intelligent to follow up with you at periodic intervals, getting his potassium and creatinine checked, his hydration well. Then I think they still can be used if there is a, a, a very strong indication like a nephrotic range or non nephrotic range proteinuria to support your use. But beyond that, beyond that, above 30 GFR, they can be very safely used. There's no problem. Dr. Pandey, sorry, I, I want to ask you one question. Yes. it has been a long-standing doubt, and now you are there, so I'll take advantage yes. of that. <laughs> are there also nephroprotective agents, these uh, ACE inhibitors and ARB? So uh, in, the, yes. you know, in the earlier stages, are they nephroprotective? Inhibitors? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, sir. Yeah. Yes. But later on, they are contraindicated in the yes. same Below distance. 15 GFR, then what happens is, uh, uh, the, the chances of acute renal acute uh, renal shutdown they increase. So okay. if the EGFR is less than fifteen, you have to be uh, you you should not be ideally using these drugs. What would you think if uh, microAL is positive and uh, EGFR is normal? It's very strongly indicated in this group. Yes, yes. If the EGFR is normal and there is a microalbuminuria, uh, see for example non-diabetic kidney disease. And diabetic kidney disease with micro and macro albuminuria are best benefited with combination of ACE ARB plus the newer calcium blockers like silnidipine or ephonodipine or azilnidipine. So these are absolutely complementary drugs to reduce blood pressure in a great way and also help proteinuria. Sometimes what happens when you uptitrate the dose of ACE inhibitor to reduce proteinuria, your potassium doesn't permit it. Potassium keeps on creeping up and up. So you you are you are you are uh, your hands are held. In uptitrating ACE or ARB, that time you add these newer calcium blockers and get down the protein. Right, we have a lot of questions coming in, but I'll just take two or three yeah. and then we'll end the session. Um, Okay, I, I'm just sorting out important ones. Um, uh, Dr. Hitesh is asking, in emergencies, people are fond of using LASIK to reduce blood pressure. Your take on this? No, no, I think I think that's uh, the way I'm telling you, sublingual nifidipine is to be condemned in acute hypertensive emergency. It can cause precipitous fall. US FDA, uh, I mean, all the guidelines say it is class three harmful. Similar way, in hypertensive emergencies, unless you check the volumic status, it is absolutely harmful drug to use. Majority of these patients have modest elevations of creatinine. As I told you, so many of them, because of their pressure natriuresis that happens in the preceding three days of presentation, they are hypovolemic, volume depleted patients. So giving lasix to them, in fact, will increase the prerenal component of renal injury in them. And therefore, it should not be used. It should not be used. In fact, in my patient, if you see, despite he being in early pulmonary edema, I hydrated him and managed his saturations with just supplemental oxygen. So, in fact, you can use CPAP or BiPAP to push the lungs, push the fluid out of the lungs, but not to use loop diuretics in the first at least 12 to 24 hours. Okay, Dr. Ajay from Mumbai is asking, classic history of aortic dissection and how to suspect? All right. The suspicion of aortic dissection is with a classic ripping, ripping chest pain starting at the front and going and radiation to the back. The second classic, uh, 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 this pain is so unbearable that you can never really mistake it. But sometimes patient, patient may have that bad pain. In that event, the second thing is inequality of pulses. Suddenly if one carotid is much weaker than the other carotid or one hand pulses are much weaker than the other hand pulses or the lower limb pulses are very weak. That is the second thing. Severe abdominal pain at the time of presentation also should arouse suspicion of aortic dissection. 
and the fourth and not the last last but not the least is a murmur of aortic regurgitation early diastolic murmur of aortic regurgitation or a pericardial friction rub pericardial friction rub this should actually be synecdoche known in the hypertensive emergency for aortic dissection perfect what about your expert opinion on ccp azelnidipin in yeah. uh, hypertension with cba with significant bradycardia oh no i think this is a I can think, you uh, yeah yeah can, drug to be used in emergency or to call i think you should answer yeah, that yeah 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 can you read it once again that question clearly what about your expert opinion on ccp azelnidipin a z e l n i d i p i n e azelnidipin Hmm. Okay, it's asking about that particular drug, the CCB. Okay, in no, there is some question issue about bradycardia, isn't okay. it? Heart rate. Yes, in, in hypertension in with CBA with significant bradycardia. Bradycardia, yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I, will, I, 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 I we skip it. Yeah, I will take it on behalf of you, Doctor Paul. Not very clear this question. Yeah. Yeah, please, no, no, this, please, please. This, this is the only calcium blocker which does yes. not uh, uh, give tachycardia. most of the uh, calcium blockers they give a little bit of tachycardia maybe 5 okay. beats 3 beats and so on okay so this actually uh, doesn't alter or produces a little bit of slowing of the heart rate so that bradi component in the question is important mm -hmm. and it depends i mean it's not going to be a huge bradycardia like beta blocker so if your mm -hmm. uh, pulse rate is say less than 50 you don't use it but if you are around 60 you can use it still thank you sir thank you perfect so a lot of questions but again we will stop it because we will over shoot the time then yeah. so the maybe minutes. another maybe another meeting sometimes so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you very thank you this uh, yeah so would you like to uh, end it yes uh, i i think uh, Uh, the speakers of course did a great job as usual and uh, i was listening to dr call for the first time but i learned a lot in your presentation dr call i was actually going to ask you what about carotid stenosis your uh, blood pressure range does it change uh, but anyway we will keep it for next time yes and dr ponde took us to emergencies uh, uh, i think we all struggle in this ecu because uh, whenever i visit I, i go to many uh, ccus and uh, every ccu has their own style of treating so i think if they all follow dr uh, uh, ponde's uh, uh, discussion today i think we'll all sort of be treating hypertensive uh, emergencies urgencies accelerated hypertension or malignant hypertension in a very very defined way and with very in in lot of similarity between each other so i think uh, uh, apart from this uh, we must thank uh, the uh, sharvier to bring us here today and nishita you uh, planned it really well in fact most of the confusion takes place when you have multiple choice and even in a uh, the closed forum Uh, uh there is a confusion so here you manage it so beautifully on the digital platform without wasting even a few seconds so congratulations for that and of course the all the uh, audio visuals also went to the perfection so i think uh, we should feel very happy at the end of the evening thank you so we are very glad to hear that and uh, it's our pleasure actually to have such eminent speakers on this platform to come and give an educational kind of uh, 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 talk for our young budding or cardiologists and internal physicians uh, so with this i would like to end the talk um, thank you so much dr hiremat sir for moderating the session thank you so much subhash call sir and pole sir for a wonderful wonderful session i'm sure it was very engaging very insightful for everybody and uh, we will have uh, uh, we will have a lot of uh, uh, I, i mean i'm sure a lot of people will have a 
lot of learning from these sessions. So with this, uh, we uh, end our session today and we move on. So tomorrow we have other two very interesting speakers and a moderator. So the very famous Dr. Jai Gopal from Kerala, who would be talking about, uh, so the sessions would be about uh, hypertension uh, uh, in patients with heart failure and at patient evidence in patients in patients with hypertension and diabetes taken by Dr. Ambuj Roy and Dr. L.S. Murthy, sir, and uh, moderated by Dr. Jai Gopal. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, audiences, for joining in, for, for all your questions, for making this session very interesting. And uh, with this, I would like to sign out. See you all tomorrow again at the same time, 7 o'clock, for the last day with three extremely eminent doctors again. So thank you so much, Hiramat sir. Thank you so much, Subhash Kaur sir. And thank, thank you, you so much, CK Pondi sir.